So if you've been sitting at the edge of your seat wondering if there was ever going to be a race for Tom Mulcair's job, well, you can sit back and relax now because there is one. That's topic one tonight. Andrew and Althea are here in Toronto. Chantelle is actually trapped by the windy weather in Montreal tonight, but we're still hooked up with her. Let me show you who's in the race for the NDP after this kind of week one already. We have three officially in. There they are. First timers running for the leadership. Nikki Ashton is expected to get in in the, uh, the next few days. And she, of course, ran against Tom Mulcair. So there's your opening lineup. Four in the NDP leadership race. Do, do those four, Andrew, tell us anything about the direction this party may be heading in? Well, it tells you that there's more than zero, which is what they had until quite recently. And I think that's, to some extent, an indication that NDP fortunes are a little better now than they were maybe six months ago. The Liberal government, when it first came in, was really sucking all the oxygen out of the left side of the spectrum. I think there's more disenchantment on the left now with some of the things the government has done, particularly, for example, reneging on electoral reform. And maybe that may be why we're starting to see more of these candidates coming in, maybe a couple more in the next few weeks. Um, but also, you know, you're going to see a range, as you see any time there's a Liberal... I should say an NDP leadership race, there's always these permanent divisions within the party between urban and rural, between establishment and grassroots. More recently, you know, some differences of, of direction between Quebec and the rest of the country. So the candidacies will reflect some of that. Chantal? Well, uh, let me make a prediction. There will not be 14 of them. <laughs> uh, so, so they should be able to have debates where we, you actually have a chance to see who's saying what uh, divides. I'm curious to see uh, if any of these candidates will be trying to fight for the Malkair legacy of moving closer to the center or whether they will all back off uh, and disown uh, the platform from the last election, which they all defended, of balanced budgets uh, go down the line, a so-so position on pipelines. I'm not sure that these divisions will emerge. I, I think they're all going to walk away from that legacy, but it remains to be seen. Uh, Althea, only four in the race, well, three plus one expected in the next day or so, but it doesn't mean there aren't going to be more because there are some other names being mentioned here. Sid Ryan, uh, Jack Meetson, which we talked about a few months ago, but uh, the Ontario MPP for the NDP, who there's a lot of buzz about him, um, but he is, I think, waiting to see what's going on with the Ontario landscape and whether the NDP provincially have a shot at forming government. Um, I think his name would inject a bit of excitement, but he isn't part of that establishment crew that we have right now. And to Shanta's point, the people who are running are far more left of the spectrum than Mr. Mulcair was. So far, Peter Julian has announced that he's against any crude oil pipelines at all. Uh, Guy Caron has announced that if he was elected, they would have a minimum basic income for every Canadian across the country. Nikki Ashton was uh, actually forthright about how uncomfortable she was during the last election with the mold care platform. Big Bernie Sanders supporter. I think we're going to really see a shift of the party to the left. What do you like about this race, Andrew, and the way it'll be conducted, as opposed to the the people. It's, it's a very different kind of race than what we're seeing unfold on the conservative side in terms of the way it's being done. Well, the, the format is very interesting. Yeah, they're going to have uh, successive rounds of voting, as we're familiar with from other previous leadership races, except they're going to have a week in between each round. So as each candidate drops out and his, his or her votes are then up for grabs, you're going to see, I think, a really quite exciting uh, interval there where everyone's uh, pushing and shoving and arm twisting to try to get them to come to their side. And also, I think, uh, just to pick on the point made previously, this is a time now for the party to, to trot out some new ideas to try and reinvigorate itself, and that's good whatever your perspective, right or left. It's good to see people debating new ideas, fresh new ideas, like, for example, the, the basic income idea. All right. Let me show you the, the Conservatives as it sits right now, because they're still sitting with 14 candidates. Here's there are seven of them and another seven. So it's, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of people, and the people haven't been dropping out, as some thought they might. They've all ponied up to the bar with their money. They all appear to be in it for the long run. Uh, if they are, I'll see, it's going to cause a problem for starters with the ballot, is it not? Well, the ballot has only space for members to rank 
10 names. So there are still going to be 14 candidates, but the ballot will only have 10 names. So once that first round is announced, there will be a lot of people who have a lot less support than perhaps you expected. And we saw Lisa Raitt, for example, say after the Edmonton Convention that it was time for about seven of the candidates to take a real hard look and look at their fundraising numbers, look at the membership they've sold, and decide. And she actually said she includes herself in this list whether or not, for the good of the party, they should stay in the race. Chantel, it doesn't appear, at least so far, that any of them are, are doing that. Well, uh, they've all paid up, right? And mm -hmm. they're not getting a refund, uh, as far as I understand, if they leave now. So presumably, someone who didn't want to campaign all that much, just go to the uh, party debates, would not have to spend a lot of money, could stay on the ballot and try to parley that bid that he's paid or she's paid for into influence. I know it doesn't sound like a very big plan, but you have to think, looking at the numbers, that there must be some of those people who realize that they are not going to get anywhere near the front of the pack, even if there's a lot of maneuvering with second and third choices, and they will be. Uh, four of them, uh, and those unnamed people that might not even get, you know, beyond uh, having run. Andrew, well, let me ask the same question I asked about the NDP. In terms of trying to understand where this party is at, in terms of its thinking, the direction it's heading, is there any clear indication of that yet, or are, they, are the 14 just so different that you can't get that sense? I think there's some uh, uh, common themes, not with every single candidate, but generally common themes that have emerged. One is that, that they need to redress some of the excesses of the Harper government in terms of tone, the harshness of tone, the excessive partisanship, the, the apparent targeting of immigrant groups or selected immigrant groups. Uh, I think there's a a sense that among most of the candidates that that was part of the reason they lost the last election. There certainly seems to be a strong consensus among all but one that they don't want to go the carbon tax route. So that's become a big cheering point. Um, or a booing point. A booing point, exactly. And I think there's also a sense, uh, and maybe also coming out of the Harper experience, that, that um, the social conservatives are going to have a bit more of a place within the party. There's only a couple of candidates who are avowedly running on a social conservative platform, but you're seeing some of the other candidates saying, you know what, we're not going to try and suppress these voices. We're going to let them have a vote, for example, on abortion if, the, if, they, if a private member's bill comes forward, these kinds of things. So they're not going to take a stand as a party on that, but they're not going to try and sort of shun them the way they, they might have been in the past. I think that's been a consensus as well. There are obviously very different tacks that some of the candidates are taking. Uh, uh, Maxime Bernier has staked out a very strong uh, free market turf, for example. Michael Chong is the only candidate talking about a carbon tax. Each of them, you see this in the debates, the line, I'm the only candidate who, <laughs> constantly comes up because you're trying to sort of stake out that, that place in the marketplace. Uh, but the biggest, the only thing I think that has potential to divide the party is on this question of of how big a constituency out there is there for the sort of Muslim bashing, anti-immigrant, populist, Donald Trump, if you will, type of message that's definitely out there on the fringe. I don't think anybody knows how big a force it is, but you can see some of the candidates angling towards that group for that support and other candidates warning very strongly we can't go down that road. Althea, the, Kevin O'Leary made a few headlines the other day by not turning up at the Edmonton debate, uh, which you were at. He said it was because there are too many in the race. Um, others said it, it was because it was a bilingual debate yeah. and, and his French is an issue, as is for many of the other candidates. But in terms of this issue of too many to have a real proper debate, has he got a point? Yes and no. I, I think that if you had fewer candidates, you would have a chance to uh, more clearly identify their weaknesses and their strengths and be able to compare them against each other. But I think the wide breadth of candidates allows you to see who the membership of the Conservative Party is and allows members to see themselves reflected in that party. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think that was fine for the first few months. But I think in hindsight, if they were redesigning <laughs> this race, you might have maybe had a preliminary round of voting roundabout now to winnow out, let's say, down to seven candidates. So then you can have that focus. Like I agree. A primary it's, it's, exactly. It's great to have that diverse range of candidates to, for, the, for all those reasons, but at some point you've got to narrow it down. But I think, uh -huh. you know, to that point, and to Chantal's earlier point, I think there might be people who are not completely delusional, like Rick Peterson, who insists, the Vancouver businessman, who insists he has a shot. But uh, people who do not want to embarrass themselves, like Mark Garneau in the Liberal leadership race, who pulled out before his meager vote total would be announced to the country. So I think that there might be people like Lisa Raitt who decide, mm, 
maybe maybe I don't want to go all the way to the end. All right, I'm, I'm running out of time, but Chantel, I want you to handle this one. I'm going to play a, a little bit of video oh, here you. from the 22 Minutes program uh, this week. Politics can be a mean business, and uh, uh, you know sometimes you set yourself up to have mean things said about you. Uh, Kelly Leach's video this week, uh, everybody seemed to make fun of it. Mark Critch certainly did on 22 Minutes. Uh, he said it looked like she was being held hostage. Did this skit with a voice of the hostage taker in the background. Watch this. And it is the reason why I'm running for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. Read it. Canada is an opportunity. I said read it. An opportunity to work hard. Do what I say. And provide for oneself and one's family. Good job. Don't worry, Kelly. I've contacted the Minister of Defence, Harjeet Sajjan, and he will rescue you. He is Sikh, though, so don't be afraid of him. He's been pre-screened. Vicious, Mark Critch. But, you know, somebody must have told Kelly Leach that that, that, that video was going to work for her, that it, you know, that it looked good. Chantal, I, how I, could something like that happen? I don't... Well, how could Stéphane Zion, who <laughs> was uh, designated as Prime Minister, have gone to the nation with a, a, a recording that didn't look as bad as that, but almost... Uh, and how could anyone around him tell him this will inspire a lot of confidence in a coalition government that you look like you're a skip from this hour is 22 minutes, Mr. Zion. So uh, that tells you something about the group think that is around the candidate or about the fact that they've given up uh, on this campaign. But there is one thing, whether you agree or not with uh, Kelly Leach's campaign theme. There is one thing that I found that party members in any party cannot stand, and it is to feel embarrassed by the person that they would otherwise back. And on that basis, uh, whether there were 50,000 or a million hits on this, this was bad for Kelly Leach. All right. Going to close out on something we haven't done for a while where we pick. Uh, we see pictures of leaders who are campaigning using ordinary people as props in the background for them. It's you know, we think that's not a good thing. Two of them today. There is uh, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, at the uh, CFB Esquimalt in uh, B.C. today, using the props in the background and, and a bit of a uniform on himself. Uh, and Donald Trump today on board a uh, U.S. Uh, aircraft carrier uh, with uh, his props in the background, both of them wearing nice uniform jackets. All right. Thank you both. Althea and Andrew here in Toronto. Chantel in Montreal.